I'm going to talk about a couple of things. One thing at the very, very beginning is just the feeling of being an independent agency, which I think is an interesting feeling. So I don't know if you remember this, but this is an old YouTube thing that I'm going to play right now that I think has to do with the feeling of being an independent agency. I guess having worked in bigger structures, and I'm sure that quite a lot of you guys have, um, in big non-independent agencies with all the stuff that goes around and all the amazing structures and the people and all that, I very recently saw this video that is a very, very old kind of YouTube joke. I thought it was very interesting to define what's the difference between being an independent agency and sometimes a small independent agency to work for a WPP big structure. So that video, I hope, it gives you a little bit of that feeling. It's a couple of people with no music behind, no orchestra, no mix, no fancy uh, musicians and sounds and stuff. It's just they feel very much on their own. They are kind of lonely and they are kind of silly and they feel a little bit silly doing what they are doing. And it does feel a little bit silly when you see it from outside. But I think it's kind of the feeling of being very, very much on your own and very much in a situation of having an opinion about what is going on in the advertising industry. And that's pretty much after having been working in uh, Wyden and Kennedy for many years and then Mother in two different periods from pretty much the very beginning to uh, Mother in London. And although they are independent agencies, they are pretty big agencies anyway. And uh, the feeling that I thought it was very interesting about being an independent agency, where you are small or medium or big, is that you have a point of view about the context outside. You have the advantage of having uh, the chance of being very, very honest about what is going on, what you think is good, what you think is bad, what you think it works, and it doesn't work. So what I will not do is to compare ourselves to um, non-independent agencies or the business of uh, advertising or marketing right now, but to the business of mathematics. My grandfather was a mathematician, my father was a fan of mathematics, and I was crap at mathematics. But all of us kind of loved mathematics for different reasons. My grandfather loved it because he wanted to have a theory that could put together in a rhythmical way all the prime numbers. And there are films about those things, there are novels about those things, and my grandfather, before those novels, was trying really hard to do that, and he couldn't find it. He couldn't find that rhythm that would put together the prime numbers in a comprehensible, um, rhythmical way. But he tried very hard for many years until he kind of went mad. And then my father was an architect, but in his way of being an architect, he was a, a structural calculus, so a guy who would make all the stuff that had to do with just keeping buildings in um, you know, one piece. And he would use quite a lot of mathematics. But what I loved the most is when my father told me about one particular mathematician that was obviously a philosopher, René Descartes. And he told me this thing about his mathematical thinking into understanding that doubt was a really interesting mathematical way. So it's the only way to understand what I'm doing and what I'm thinking, the fact that I'm thinking is through the doubt, doubting pretty much everything until the only thing that I'm not doubting, of course, is the fact that I'm doubting. So Descartes became a cool character uh, in a kind of my life because I believe that doubting is an important, crucially important element for creativity. When you put everything in doubt and when you work around doubt more than 
certainties, you are in a very, very uncharted territory, in a very dangerous territory as well, and a very unsettling situation. And I think that's pretty much the way that independent advertising agencies kind of work in a very, very completely dangerous situation every single day. So the doubt is important, and I think it applies to this very, very initial thing that has to do with the word doubt that comes from duo. So A versus B is either this or that. But interestingly, the source of creativity is the world of ideas. So the essence of ideas is actually also based in two elements, apparently which is not A versus B, but A plus B. So you have one thing and you put it together with another thing. Steve Jobs, everybody talks about, every single time is about the combination of two elements make an idea. But I would say that I'd like to doubt about that theory. I don't believe that um, creativity or ideas come from two elements combined, but from three elements combined. A trio or a threesome, if you want to find a sexier word for it which is A plus B plus C. What is C? Well, C, I believe, is you or me. Uh, A plus B are the things that are out there that I kind of see together, but C, crucially the most important element of this, which reveals authorship, which is a very interesting concept, I believe, has to do with the fact that there is someone who is putting those two things together in a completely unique way. And there can be many people who think about this thing and that thing together, but there is going to be only one people who can put those three things together if that involves you. And that has to do with a crucially important element of opinion in what we do. So I have an opinion about what is going on, and I want to walk you through a little bit and very quickly of the things that terrify me and fascinate me at the same time. So don't expect that I'm going to have a conclusion about this, but I'm going to just pass my uh, agony over to you for you to deal with it if you want to deal. Martin Ford is a very, very interesting author who talks about robotics and the, obviously the elements, and we were uh, uh, clearly talking about this or uh, hearing this in the presentation before, that has to do with elements of technology coming into our lives. And the doubt, according to Martin Ford, is revealed not only in his book, The Rise of Robots, that I strongly recommend, but also in We Robots by, by Curtis White, who is a an amazing writer who also was a hero of uh, David Foster Wallace. So kind of very interesting guys who are talking about technology in a much more interesting way than the hyper-technological way. They talk about it in a humanistic way. In the case of Curtis White, it's very clear. And also in an ethical way, in the case of Martin Ford. These two guys, I met both of them very briefly in two different South by Southwest, are probably the most prominent figures in artificial intelligence today. Um, they were both of them the creators of the first uh, kind of successful artificial uh, assistant, and now they are developing a new project that has to do with artificial intelligence that you'll see in a second. This guy is called Jaron Lanier. Jaron Lanier is a Microsoft guy, he used to be an Atari guy ages ago, and if you check him out, despite his crazy looks and his love for musical instruments that are funny and strange and old, he um, has a in very, very interesting skeptical vision about what the future is holding and is waiting uh, in terms of technology mixed with our organic lives up to now. And this guy wrote uh, Who Owns the Future, a pretty amazing book that talks about all the dangers of technology coming in. If you didn't want uh, to hear much about the uh, dangers, I want to give you this element of Viv. That's how Viv, the artificial intelligence that I show you, these two smiley guys talking about, is this terrifying thing that is in here. Some people consider it amazing, South by Southwest heroes, and people who are like rock and roll stars, and they actually are in many senses, because very, very powerful what they are doing, interesting and incredibly creative. But it's also, according to that Photoshop in there, horrible and terrifying as well. So what do we do? Well, what we do is we consider what happened in the past with us when we were confronted to innovation. But more than us, why don't we go back a little bit in time and see one incredibly skeptical guy in relationship to innovation? And that guy was Socrates. And Socrates had a big issue with two elements that I put here in Spanish. La escritura y la lectura. The writing and the reading. He was skeptical about them. And he was terrified about the fact that 
writing and reading could be incredibly dangerous for our flexible thinking. He was saying that once you have the tools to write your stuff, your stuff is going to get solidified in a way that probably is not going to have the flexibility that has in a conversation, the ability to change through a conversation. Reading, the same thing. Once you are able to read something, you, draw you get to conclusions that are someone else's conclusions because they are written. And he was kind of right. I mean, if you look at the Bible and the comprehension of sacred uh, writings, and some people obsessed by the letter of the word, and if you look at the contract and how incredibly boring is a contract, well, writing was bloody dangerous, and he was right. Now, was it a disaster? Well, I would argue that it wasn't a disaster. I think you have many cases of amazing books that could prove you the other way around. But certainly, every single time there has been a breakthrough in innovation, there has been a fear. And both things are legitimate. Unamuno wrote about the agony of Christendom and has to do with the agony of believing and not believing at the same time and suffering with that, but how creative that was. So, who doesn't believe in Descartes and the doubt? Raymond Kurzweil, and as you know, this guy is probably one of the most important technology guys in the world because of his position in Google, but also his history of working on predictions on technology and artificial intelligence and so on. And Ray Kurzweil believes that the world is going to be far better with technology and lives are going to be increased by 100 and 150 years, something like that. Bodies are going to be compounded by parts that are going to be artificial and are going to be natural, and the combination of both is going to be kind of all right. He's an engineer, and he's an optimist. And when you look at his optimism and you see things like that, you tell me what you feel. This is South by Southwest this year, and this is an artificial robot called, artificial arm called Kuga, Japanese company, right? There is sound here. Try to play with sound. is unbelievable is me. I actually showed this video once, only once, in Spain in a conference. And uh, uh, I don't know if you hear, but there is a person that is there saying that this arm has been doing this thing for the whole day. What does this video mean for me? That there is a fascination in technology and humans about predictability, being predictable and having a world that is predictable. And technology is kind of promising that there are going to be many things going on in the future that are going to be reassuring, predictable, because we are terrified of unpredictability. So we want things to have an initial surprise and then to keep going on and on and on like this. This is a work of art by a mathematician. But I think it pretty much defines a little bit of what is that thinking of the closed circuit of an initial creativity that goes on and on and on, even if it is absurd. And we like or kind of like this. Now, are there terrifying things around this? Yes, there are terrifying things. In South by Southwest, there was a woman who was talking about artificial intelligence in relationship and facial recognition in relationship with racial elements and with um, features. And there are two or three companies in the States that are working for defense or with defense in the government tracing faces in airports and places and public places saying we can detect how dangerous people are based on um, facial elements. So as incorrect and horrible and stupid as this sounds, these guys have been able to sell quite a lot of the product to some different companies and government institutions just for research to see how far they can go. How different this is from Nazi propaganda and stuff like that? I don't think there is a lot, but you can see that in their presentation, faceception, you can check them out. 
is um, you can see um, a brand uh, promoter like that or a white collar offender or a terrorist with the regulatory uh, black mustache and uh, you know a skin like me. So basically, not very different from what it used to be the Nazi propaganda regarding uh, Jewish. Or you can have artificial intelligence applied to uh, the Queen. And sorry, this is not me who is doing the interpretation, but artificial intelligence that is saying there is a 99.7% of uh, possibilities that that is a shower cap. <laughs> so thank God artificial intelligence still gets it wrong. Or artificial intelligence does silly things like, for instance, getting fascinated by the relationship between the divorce rate in Maine and the per capita consumption of margarine in the US. And they seem to be incredibly related, one and the other. What's the correlation? You got it there. It's pretty amazing. So there are some people who are worried about this, and Microsoft seems to be leading this thing. And I guess Microsoft is in the same situation that I am, fascinated by it, trying to make a lot of business out of that, and scared. Um, amazingly about it. And this woman is a woman from Microsoft who has developed this initiative to understand the dangers of artificial intelligence coming in. I'm going to go through on and on and on, and there are people who are telling you uh, in this ocean test uh, who is what in relationship to consumption or voting politicians, and it can give you quite a lot of good advice in what to say to every single voter according to their personality traits based on five different groups. Technology, again, seems very reassuring. It tells you everything about people. And then you have the Vatican that is all over technology. They are fascinated. And there was a very interesting talk um, called Compassionate Disruption, the Vatican and Innovation. You can place right now the word innovation next to anything. And you're going to be cool and you're going to be fine. So innovation labs can run in any place, and the Pope seems to be kind of aware of that and is trying to do something with that. Now, the interesting thing is that these guys are very smart, and that archbishop over there is a very, very interesting guy in relationship to technology, and they are getting better and better. I'm talking about now the Catholic Church. But there is a problem. Outside of that sort of bubble, there is a lot of people out there, normal, I guess could be the word, people, who don't believe in any of this stuff. The doubt about media has been uh, the highest level of doubts or the lowest level of credibility ever. And it happens the same with the uh, church or organized religion, 41% compared to 65% in the 70s. The banks, of course. The big business has never been very, very high, but now it's lower than ever. The presidency, and I have no idea because it's, this is pre-Trump. The Congress is the lowest of them, and we're talking about the US, right? This is uh, MIT working together with uh, researchers and uh, the Washington Post. And interestingly, defense and law, the militars, are uh, showing a very interesting increase in the US, at least, about uh, credibility on what they are doing. So it feels like. Uh, you are concretely risking your life, therefore you deserve a little bit of my trust. And I would add Kant's lion to this thing. This is a, a, an official completely, I just grab a, a graphic going down and I put Kant. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I don't believe in any of the stuff that advertising is trying to sell in terms of success. I have the feeling that we are building, I'm not saying we here, but quite a lot of agencies and advertising professionals and marketing professionals have been selling lies in relationship to success. They've been saying that this thing has been amazingly successful based on dodgy data. And I think that is pretty much fed by institutions like Can Lion and so on and so forth that actually have proven that can be incredibly beneficial, not to the market, but to the agencies and to some salaries and to some bonuses. There is an algorithm that indicates, it has happened ages ago, and uh, very uh, smartly Martin uh, Sorrell uh, got it, that relates the amount of lion, can lions, and the gun report with uh, the share, the uh, price of the stock uh, of the agencies in Wall Street and they could show that they were going up in the same way that margarine and US uh, and Maine uh, divorce rate were going. Uh, so basically, academia uh, is also being fed by fake 
uh, not news, as Trump would say, but fake data. And there is a huge amount of doubt from all of us in what technology is going to bring us. What I like the most about this guy, who is a partner of us at New, is that Alex Sandy Pendlan is uh, the head of human dynamics at MIT Media Lab. And being an academic puts him in a very interesting situation of being analyzing constantly the rights and wrongs and the bullshit or not of the things that he's seen coming. And he's been there for a while. So one thing that he wrote that kind of shook the world of big data and data analytics is this book called Social Physics. And he basically claimed in that book that he could, and actually there are some very interesting case studies in which he could do that, understand social uh, behavior when it becomes, uh, in, a, in a big scale, when it becomes an element of lots of data put together that show you a pattern of behavior, and it can show you how those patterns of behavior can evolve in time if you have enough information from what has happened until now. The interesting thing about this guy is that when I sat down with him for the first time and I asked him about what was the relationship between all that stuff that he had and creativity, he said to me, I have no clue, I have no idea, I don't know. And I love that because he had a same uh, issue that I have in life that has to do with constant affinity towards doubt. When he talks about creativity, he has his point of view. Is it my point of view? No, but it's an interesting one, I believe. So may I ask, what's the role for creativity and data in New? And what I'd say is that the theory that people have about creativity, I think, is, is a little wrong. Creativity has more to do with people putting things together than the light bulb in a particular head. And the data that is needed about that is about human behavior, or human preferences, about society. And it's it's putting that data in the hands of creative types who will shape it, who will, will forge it into something that affects people, that propagates these ideas, um, that changes society, that is, uh, I think, the most interesting thing about you. What did we do with that? What we basically are doing is that we put together three disciplines in one place and a team that is combining in every possible project Three things, the creative power of art or the intuitive power of art, the scientific power of data analytics, and the investigative or inquisitive power of journalism. And uh, journalism is at the top. It's not the creative part or it's not the data part. But the thing that is at the top is the fundamental importance of what questions are we asking out there to people. Are we listening? Are we really trying to understand what is going on out there? Can we do this with journalists? Are journalists right now with the issues that journalists are having in relationship to having a good job, which is a very, very difficult thing right now for investigative journalism, and whoever has been working in that knows how difficult it is to get funded for investigative journalism, um, how important it could be for us to get to a point that is very, very important in what we do, and it's incredibly uh, underestimated, which is the truth. This is the board of advisors. It's Julia Golding from CMO from Lego, Christine Bacho, psycholo uh, social psychologist, uh, Craig Dyker is an architect who is the founder of Snowet Architects, Rob DeFlorio, ex Nike, Becca Van Dyke uh, is the uh, global um, marketing uh, director of uh, Facebook, and Phil McAvitt is an ex Nike that now is at Westfield in Australia globally. What is it that we did with all these things? It's interesting because there was no single company that could actually get what we could do for them with this. I mean, we had quite a lot of experience in advertising. We had a lot of data analytics to put together with that. And we had the idea that putting that together with good questions could be great. But there was not a single company that could actually find a way of getting us there. But it wasn't a company, but a government that actually got to us through a very, very strange story of a spiritual leader from India who had someone who knew me. And they came to us to say, we have a problem. We are helping Colombia with the peace agreement, but we have two issues. We don't know how to talk with the FARC about actually getting to these conversations with society and in, in a uh, proactive way. And we should 
actually advise the FARC in communicational ways, that's one. And also we need to work with the government in making them understand whether the referendum is going right or wrong. So I'm going to be very, very quickly on this thing, help FARC to re-engage with society, one, and the brief second is analyze referendum scenarios. We travel quite a lot. We put people from different places of the world working together, from technology to be on the field. And this is one of the things that we did, most important things that we did is just to get there. So the FARC, after uh, really good meetings in Havana, and we'll show you a little bit of this with the commanders of the FARC, we also were invited to the camps. This is uh, my room, and that was two, it was three days and two nights. And uh, this is an AK-47 in the left, and that's um, uh, food and the economia, as they call it. Uh, this is a place that is nine hours away from Florencia, Caquetá. Not only not internet, obviously, but not phone lines, nothing, and it's really, really hot and humid and incredibly uncomfortable. And this is just the way that you see people and everyday life in there, and you realize that you are in a good place when you're able to record a video without having any problem of two uh, FARC guerrilla guys having uh, a little bit of a moment on uh, the routine. And I could be able to have conversations with not only the commanders in uh, Colombia, but also the soldiers in, uh, in uh, the jungle. But then there was another guy who was there from, that works for New York Times and Washington Post and New Yorker and so on, but he's from Getty. He's called Mario Tama. And in the same time that I was doing what I was doing, just talking with people, he took some photographies. And these are the photographies. And sometimes we are underestimating quite a lot when it comes to research, the value of beauty. But it's the informative value of beauty apart from the amazing aesthetic experience. What he was doing by doing this and by using black and white instead of color is just to trying to get to the human tragedy that is happening there with these guys and, understand, and helping us understanding them a little bit better. In Havana, we sat down with the commanders. This is Pablo Catatumbo, one of the three commanders. Uh, that on the right is a, a photography that uh, Florencia from New took of Pablo Catatumbo. And, uh, after nine and a half hours of conversations, we realized that the whole point for the FARC was to simply meet the families of the victims and just to say sorry in person one by one. And because they are a Stalinist army, once they agree on something, they go for it. And they went for it. And we were amazed that within a week and a half, they were already arranging meetings in Havana with the families. That was an amazing thing because basically what they did was to apply in a strategy that we suggested to them that had to do with do not explain anymore why you're doing what you're doing. What you need to start with, if you really feel that that's what you have to do, is just say sorry to them. Just say sorry. And wait for them to come back with a question if they do. Because they are used to being controlled, as I said, and a Stalinist army is an incredibly control freak organization, they couldn't deal with this thing of letting audiences go. That's why propaganda is such a strong arm in the FARC. They really want to control every single element of behavior. And they realized that they couldn't. And intelligently, they decided that they shouldn't. So this is one of the meetings that they had. And after they formally said sorry to the first uh, familiar, uh, relatives of victims, you're going to see this kid over here who lost his father when he was nine, and now he's 19, and he's saying thank you to the FARC leaders for saying sorry. I'm not going through this because there is no time for this, but basically what happened is the relatives of the victims felt incredibly, strangely, weirdly thankful to the fact that these guys were coming and saying sorry. Gallup confirmed this when, the, uh, when there was research on the popularity positive uh, view of the FARC that was established in a six, five, six percent. All of a sudden in three months went from six to 18 percent. Does that have to do with advertising or strategy or propaganda? No, it doesn't. The only thing it has to do is with the fact that these guys sat down, said sorry, and they stopped. And until now, there is a credibility that they are, is growing with them, and they are understanding that credibility, and there is a positive circle that hopefully, and I touch wood, is going to continue over there. Now, the referendum was a completely different thing. We met with Cesar Gaviria, former president, and a star in the series Narcos. Uh, 
and we talk with children in a school and we realized that by doing that we could understand exactly not what children were thinking about the referendum but what their parents were thinking about the referendum and how much they were lying. That's something that any <coughs> of these organizations, obviously students and militars, any of these big organizations that were doing polls were doing. They were not doing this and they were not asking this, but we did something else. When we asked about whether they were going to vote yes or no to the peace treaty, we added one more question after that. We said, would you, wait yes? would you vote yes or no? And they said exactly the same that they were saying to Gallup, to anyone. 60% yes, we vote for peace, 40% no. Why did no win then? Because they hadn't asked the question that they should have asked, which is, if you wanted to vote and you could vote an angry yes, or si con rabia, angry yes, would you do that? And that was an interesting thing because people from no to peace agreement didn't move from there, but people with yes answer to the peace agreement said, yeah, I would go for an angry yes. That meant that basically internally they were either thinking to vote for no, really, or not voting at all. And that movement was a 15% movement. Therefore, all this stuff that is in here well, this is a lot of information, uh, about the pollsters who were going, we are winning, we are winning, the yes is winning, everything is going to be fine, ended up in the Descartes situation. They should have doubted that because our data was saying something else, but the good thing for us is that we could actually show this and it was recorded and it was in the press later on based on the fact that we had been recorded saying the no is going to be much bigger than you guys think and we have some parallel data that is showing that. Why that happened, and there is a video with that that I will not show you, uh, because that was a very, very important thing that started going then in, uh, in the biggest uh, uh, media in Colombia, because we asked different questions and we put doubt in the mix. The same doubt that should have been applied to Trump, and I did this drawing in September 2016, not to say that, wow, I did it before. A lot of people were saying that Trump was bigger than uh, people expected. But one thing that we did say through this drawing and this very silly cartoon is that there was an energy around Trump that has to do with a little bit of the suicide energy. Maybe we kill ourselves by doing this, but at least it's kind of fascinating. We're going to have... Uh, a moment of suicide of the country, and maybe that is better than the boredom of um, simple political uh, boring corruption that is uh, being offered by, and I'm kind of voicing something that I'm thinking, Hillary Clinton. Uh, what we are doing is uh, we are trying desperately through Monsignor Lucio Ruiz to work with the Vatican and we are in conversations over and over and over again. But in the meantime, what we are doing is we are learning quite a lot about what the church is doing in relationship to communication and the use of technology. One day I will give you a nice talk about that. There is no time for that. But one interesting thing that I can tell you about the Vatican is that as much as they are incredibly uh, focused on Twitter and Instagram, as they are, and Pope Francis is very successful in Instagram, for instance, with 3 point something million and 33 million in Twitter, one medium that they are very, very aware of and is very important for them is shortwave radio. Believe it or not, 1950 something shortwave radio. Why? Because Twitter in China doesn't make any sense, or in some parts of Africa, or in some parts of the world that are geographically difficult, you get there through the missions and um, to important people for the church through shortwave radio without any censorship and any filter. And that is still a medium that is as important for them in many aspects as internet could be. So that is a kind of a mind-blowing innovation sort of way of thinking about this. NASA, we are working with these people, ground systems developments and operations on how one part of this organization can actually explain the other part of uh, NASA what they are for and what they are doing and why they are cool and important and also to explain to uh, bigger audiences and political audiences in Washington why they should be funded. Uh, interestingly, and we were seeing this in augmented reality with foods, but we are working with this resilience industry. There is a company that's actually having developed an amazing food detector um, and a, a food scan that can actually detect in raw food, pure raw food, whether there is a presence of pesticides and is genetically modified uh, elements in there 
or is bacteria in there? And that could be applied to water or meat or vegetables. All of that has to be raw or fruits. And we believe that by uh, helping these guys and working alongside them, we are going to be part of what I believe is a revolution in the way that we see food and we acquire food by understanding really what is going on with the food that we are buying in first hand. We also have this client in which we, we have a, a partnership with them. Uh, we have a very, very small stock in this company, but I'm very hopeful that this company can actually provide a very interesting solution for modern cities in regards to uh, cycling. And it's a hybrid electric uh, bicycle that doesn't look silly and is foldable at the same time. And it's kind of cool looking. Um, and this could be, in the future, hopefully, a really interesting urban alternative to very, very um, busy cities like London or Tokyo. And we are developing this yerba mate that has a very strange, uh, obscure name that has to do with the history of mate. Whoever speaks in Spanish is going to understand that it's also a word that is a very, very raw, a rude word. But what we are trying to do is to work on an organic tea that doesn't say that it is organic and is also socially just, uh, just and fair, so it's fair trade, but it's not saying that anywhere. Why? Because we believe that right now in this transition period back to organic food, a lot of people are believing that organic food is ugly. And although no data is showing this thing, there is a premium audience that is saying organic is good. There is a lot of audiences who are saying organic is actually weird, and I'm not sure whether I'm ready for that type of taste. Is that data that is actually helping us to understand that? No, we want to create the data by provoking through a new product. And of course, we are working for AB InBev, sorry, AB InBev in uh, two pretty interesting projects, a new beer that is being developed and also a complete cultural shift within the company that if we do and we help them with that, we're going to feel that we have done something pretty major. Um, so basically, back to the card and the doubt and the possibilities of the doubt, I would say I doubt enormously that those things from uh, CAN or uh, DNAD or even the Nobel Prize can help us really understand whether something that we are doing is good or bad. I think the most important thing that we have to do is to apply our own uh, skepticism uh, to this thing. And uh, we should probably apply uh, this concept to anything that we do, or at least I would say before suggesting this thing, that there is a Latin phrase always for everything, and there is always a cool Latin phrase, and I love this one, which is, the corruption of the good is the worst corruption of all. And is uh, by using creativity in a corrupted way, in the sense of inventing a result or creating a case or doing something that is not necessarily a reflection of what happened, we are shooting on our food. And I believe that most of us are aware of this and we are convinced that that is the case. And I hope that you guys share the fact that the most important thing that probably we should be worried about is what is going to happen with us as humans in the future, with our values, with our sense of love, with our sense of identity, with our connection with others. Hopefully our creativity can be applied to simple things and enormously important things like that. Thank you very much.